All right, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about a new Chinese thinker called Lao Tzu. Uh, and his book is called Tao Te Ching. Tao Te Ching. It has been said that uh, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, the book, has been translated into uh, so many languages that it, this book is only second to the Holy Bible in terms of uh, the times of being translated. Uh, so we're going to talk about this, and this is a short book. So in your um, in your reading, uh, you actually read the whole book. There are only eighty one passages. Yeah, I mean those passages are called a, are called a chapters, but they're actually passages. Okay, so so let's talk about uh, Lao Tzu. All right. So first, we're going to talk about the book, because um, you know for a lot of the ancient texts. Uh, we actually don't know exactly the connection between the author and the text, because what we have is text, right? Um, but we don't know whether the text has been authored by the alleged uh, author or not, right? For example, uh, we know that uh, Iliad, uh, the, it has been said that Iliad's, uh, Iliad's author is Homer. But who is Homer? We don't, we don't know about him, right? We don't know too much about him. Uh, is he a real person? Or is he a group of person? We, 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 don't, we don't know. Or, or, or is Iliad really, or Odysseus really authored by Homer? We don't know. Uh, it's just a legend, right? Uh, the, 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 the same thing is true for Lao Tzu and Tao Te Ching. So although historically, many scholars believe that Tao Te Ching was authored by Lao Tzu, but we don't know whether this, this is true or not, okay? So what we have is just text. Okay, so first let's talk about the text. The text, uh, in 20th century, early 20th century, a lot of Chinese scholars believe that the Lao Tzu's uh, Tao Te Ching, this book actually was produced much later than, than, than we have thought uh, historically. Um, until uh, in 1972 uh, and 1973, there is a major historical discovery in Hunan, China, uh, in central China, in the place called Ma Wang Dui. Um, the construction workers, they're trying to build a railroad. They're trying to build a tunnel in the, in the mountain. And then when they use a detonator to bomb uh, the mountain, they accidentally found an ancient tomb. They found an ancient tomb. Okay, this is called the Ma Wang Dui Han period tomb. The tomb is from Han period. Uh, and the and it turned out that um, this early Han tomb was never raided. Uh, this is quite rare, actually. This is quite unusual in, for Chinese tombs, uh, ancient Chinese tombs. Uh, so as a result, we discovered the entire text of Tao Te Ching written by brush with ink on the silk cloth. Actually, there, there, there are many texts written on silk cloth discovered from this ancient tomb. But the Chinese archeologists, ar how they work with the ancient tomb is that they basically remove everything. See, see this picture, right? They remove everything uh, above the tomb. Basically they remove the roof, uh, remove the dirt, remove the mount until it became a huge pit. And then they just excavate everything from the pit. Okay, so this is a tomb, this is a tomb. Um, and there are a lot of uh, quite amazing historical discoveries from this tomb. This tomb is around like 150 BCE, uh, yeah, around that time. Uh, and uh, we, we also found a mummy, okay? So this picture shows the mummy uh, excavated from the tomb. Uh, she's a woman. She's the wife of the local king uh, of the Changsha area. Uh, the Chang she, she is the wife of the Changsha king. So she's an aristocratic woman. Uh, this is why she was buried with, with this very luxury, luxurious tomb, right? She was buried uh, with a, a lot of utensils, a lot of uh, funerary objects, but most importantly, with an entire library. So she was buried with all the library, all the books she liked, okay, in her tomb, in her tomb. And that because of the unique uh, microbiotic um, 
environments in the town, somehow her body was so well preserved, so well preserved. This is very unusual because Chinese did not have a specific tradition of mummifying uh, the dead. Uh, so, so the reason her body was preserved, so well preserved, it was an accident, actually. Uh, well, the Han people didn't want to uh, have, uh, they didn't want to be immortal in the sense that they wanted to, at least their body would never decay. Uh, they used all kinds of methods to preserve the body, but uh, the, they did not, I mean, unlike the ancient Egyptians, the Chinese did not invent a specific technology to mummify the, the body. Uh, their belief is that if you use a lot of jade objects, so this you know, jade objects is considered as as having supernatural power. Uh, if you bury it with a lot of jade covering up your your whole body, and you use jade objects to stuff or block all your body holes, uh, including your ears, you know your your nostrils, your mouth, uh, the belief is that you can your body. Can be preserved longer. You know, sometimes for aristocratic, for aristocrats, uh, they even the dead uh, were buried with entire clothes uh, or case, you know, covering their whole body with the with the jade, uh, with jade. Well, okay, this woman, when this woman was discovered in 1972, uh, she was so well preserved that her skin is still soft. Yeah, you can you can point at her skin, and it still bounces back. Yeah, uh, and uh, scientific research showed that she she died of some kind of disease, and we even found out what she ate before she died. Uh, but anyway, so what's important is, is that we we have this entire text of Lao Tzu buried with her. So this confirms the dating of Lao Tzu Dao De Jing the text. To early Han period, so we know that in early Han period, the uh, the whole book was already there. It's just uh, uh, the order of chapters a little bit different, but ninety uh, percent, more than ninety percent of the, the the words are exactly the same as 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 the version you 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 read this semester. So yeah, this this book you read to, uh, this this week, uh, this week is is uh, is at least from 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 the Han period. Uh, from 150 BCE. But then in 1994, we have another uh, discovery in Hubei province called Guodian. Uh, we found another tome, and uh, we found more of the texts of Lao Tzu in the tome. But this time, those um, these words, uh, the words were written on bamboo strips, on bamboo strips. You know, ancient Chinese books before the Han Dynasty, before the invention of paper in China. Chinese invented paper independently, okay? Uh, during the Han Dynasty, uh, but before Han Dynasty, uh, before to uh, like 150 BCE, uh, books were written uh, with either knife or brush on bamboo or wooden slips like this, and the wooden slips are stringed up, are strung up with the with the ropes. So that's that's how Chinese books are. Uh, so the Guodian version of Lao Tzu shows that uh, two thirds of the existing version. Of Lao Tzu are already there, and the, the dating of a Gordian tongue is warrants this period. So this further confirms that the the the, the text of Dao De Jing was already there as early as in warrants this period. Okay, it's probably not earlier than that warrants this period. So so in other words, it's probably later than the analects that we read. But uh, but it's there, but the the you know uh, the the bulk. The majority of the chapters are already there uh, in in the worst days period. So that's the um, uh, that's the text. That's what we know about the text. Um, now, both Guo Dian and Ma Wang Dui, they're in southern China, and we know that in worst days period, most of the Taoist thinkers lived in southern China. So this shows a very interesting regional difference, uh, cultural difference in China. Northern people and, and Southern, Northern Chinese and Southern Chinese, they had a kind of different, a little bit different tradition. Confucianism, very popular in the North, but Taoism, popular in the South. Uh, we know that today, most Chinese live 
in the South, but this was not the case in the worst in early China. In early China, agriculture was far more developed in the North. So this allowed more population to, uh, to live in the North. Uh, during the Warren Cis period, the largest country of, is called a Chu and is located in the South. But uh, a lot of, you know, most of places in, in Southern China in Warren Cis period, they have not been developed. They're shrouded by forests. Shrouded by forests, okay, uh, and the and the uh, the population living in southern China, they're not strictly Chinese in today's sense because they uh, we know that a lot of uh, there are a lot of ethnic minorities, ethnic groups uh, living in southern China. They spoke a language totally incomprehensible to the northerners. Okay, they probably spoke a language similar to today's Vietnamese. Okay. Uh, well, today's Vietnamese, they firmly believe that if, if you look at a Vietnamese textbook, they believe that they, their ancestors migrated from China during this time period. Okay. So, I mean, this is what Vietnamese believe. This is probably true. Uh, but we need, I, in my opinion, we need more evidence to really confirm uh, the, the, the migration. But, um, but today's Vietnamese believe that they, their ancestors migrated to today's Vietnam from southern China. Uh, during uh, about 2,000 years ago, uh, around this time we're talking about. So, so although the, the state of Chu uh, was the largest, but uh, and, and 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 its army was also the largest, but it, its territory contained a lot of ethnic minorities who, according to Han, uh, not not Han, but there, there was no Han Chinese back uh, during Wars this period, right? Actually, the the I mean today, the largest ethnic group in China is called Han Chinese, right? I, I am a Han Chinese, right? You know, the government, Chinese government would say, my ethnicity is Han, right? It's sort of like, Han Chinese is sort of like the wasps in the United States in the 19th century, the majority of uh, the ethnic majority, right? Um, but this name Han Chinese came from the Han dynasty that came after the Qing, okay? Well, it, so it's, 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 about like 100 years later than the Warren States period that we're talking about. Okay, okay, back to back to Taoism. Taoism seemed to have originated from southern China. Okay, uh, there are many many uh, evidence to 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 show that. So, uh, to what degree Taoism has to do with all these uh, southern tradition? Uh, it's, it's it's a question worth asking. To what degree Taoism has to do with the, even say the hunter gatherers and the uh, ethnic minorities in the south it's 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 a question i have been thinking i have been thinking you know i i i actually personally believe that taoism may have something to do with all these uh, non chinese hunter gatherers uh, living in southern china so they have a very different tradition from from the northern civilization we know that in the north uh, early dynasties like the xiaoshang and zhou they have been there for like more than 1000 years right the shang dynasty was already there right At the, Agriculture developed very early, civilization was there, writing was there, cities have been there. But in the South, South, the South was by and large underdeveloped in the world's history period. So those, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, almost all world's history period, the Taoist thinkers are from the South. The, the Southern people, they're having their very different tradition. And the uh, and then, okay, here's a little preview of Taoism before we move on to the text. One common trait among almost all the Taoists is that they're not, they, they're suspicious about civilization. They have this very strong suspicion about whether civilization is a good thing or not. Okay, we're, we're gonna get into details about, about this. So this, uh, this is suspicion or this uh, critique may, Maybe from the very unique cultural environment in the South, right? Uh, when when um, when when civilization developed in a very different way, right? A lot of Southern people still intermingled with with a lot of non-Chinese hunter-gatherers, whose lifestyle is totally different from the uh, uh, Northern Chinese who firmly believe in like like ancient culture, ritual, music, right? All these things. So Taoists are very different. We're talking about a Southern tradition, okay? Now let's move on to Lao Tzu the person. So is Lao Tzu the person really 
is he real? Basically, we're asking the question: Is 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 Louds the person really a, a real person? Well, uh, our in, historian's information about the author of Dao De Jing came from a a text called the Records of Grand Historians, Shi Ji. Okay, this this uh, this this history book was authored by a historian called Sima Qian, who lived in the Han Dynasty. Okay, Sima Qian was the official historian commissioned by the imperial court in the Han Dynasty. He lived around in the 180, I'm sorry, uh, 100 BCE, okay, before, before Jesus Christ. So, so in other words, Sima Qian lived in the time about like two or 300 years away from Warren's Test period, right? Uh, but still, Sima Qian had no idea who Lao Tzu is. And in, in, in his biography for Lao Tzu, he provided three possible historical figures who might be Lao Tzu. Three of them, okay? I, so so even, even ancient people couldn't figure out who is Lao Tzu. So he's, this guy is very mysterious, okay? Very mysterious. Um, for the first historical figure Sima Qian mentioned, who may be Lao Tzu, Sima Qian reported that Lao Tzu was a, a person lived around Confucius time, okay, in, war, in spring and autumn period, okay? And he's a little bit older than uh, and Confucius. And this Lao Tzu worked as a archivist or librarian for the Zhou court in Luoyang city, okay? And the legend has it that Kong Tzu or Confucius traveled to Luoyang and visited Lao Tzu to ask him about questions about the ancient ritual. So he's supposedly a, a, a person very knowledgeable uh, in the spring and autumn period. But from the language of today's Dao De Jing, we know that this book could not have been written in spring and autumn period, okay? The philological studies have shown that a lot of terms, uh, phrases used in today's Dao De Jing uh, has to be from Warren's this period. So it cannot be that early. It cannot be that early. So, so, so there's so much we don't know about, about the author, the authorship uh, of, the, of the text. And so uh, again, according to Sima Qian, Lao Tzu, the librarian working for the Zhou court, uh, he not only he, ta he, he talked to Confucius and he criticized Confucius' um, obsession about ancient ritual. Lao Tzu supposed, I mean, reportedly, told Confucius that uh, you, you're so obsessed with the ritual uh, and what, you, um, what you're really interested in is doomed to rot, just like everything else in history. Everything is doomed to rot, okay? So you need to have a different attitude towards history. You know? it's, it's some, some very vague instructions uh, given to Confucius. And then Samatian reported that uh, after this meeting, Lao Tzu was so disappointed at the degeneration of his own time. So he decided that he's gonna become a hermit. He's gonna leave the city. He left the Luoyang city. He left his job. He left the Zhou court that hired him. And he was riding a, an ox, he was riding an ox. So this is why uh, you know, all these image about Lao Tzu is all about this old man riding on a buffalo, okay, this is a buffalo. <laughs> well, you know, the Chinese word in new refers to both a buffalo and ox, so we, we don't differentiate that that much. Uh, so, so he was riding this uh, buffalo and he, he tried to escape uh, civilization. When he travels all the way west, he was stopped by a border, a border official. Okay, uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, he was stopped by, by someone called Ishi, who worked as an, an officer at the border. So, so this officer heard that Lao Tzu is a knowledgeable person. So he, 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 he is a sort of a kind of a, um, a failed, this, this, this a border guard uh, felt kind of a pitiful that this such a knowledgeable person is going to, uh, you know, go into uh, become a hermit. So he asked Lao Tzu to write down his teaching. He insisted Lao Tzu to write down his teaching before he let Lao Tzu get out of the border. Okay, so 
legend has it that it allows to roll down 5,000 Chinese characters. And thus, this is the book. And then after he authored this book, he, 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 went, out of, he went out of the border and no one knows where he, he went. No one knows where he went. So this is, you know, during Han Dynasty, this is a legend about the authorship of the book. It's from Lao Tzu, and, uh, and Lao Tzu did not want to talk about his own teaching. He, 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 he wrote down his teachings only because a, a government officer, official insisted that he must write it down. He had to write it down, basically. I, I, th I think that I think the, the tenant of the story is to show that Taoists, they don't want to, they don't want to talk. They don't want to give a lecture. They don't want to author books. They, they do this, they leave traces of their teachings only because they had to, when they, when they were forced, okay? When they were compelled to, okay? So this is, uh, this is the, uh, the authorship. Uh, of course, later, uh, when Buddhism came to China around 200 AD uh, in the late Han period, um, some Taoists, uh, they made up some, some new legend. They say Lao Tzu actually went to India, okay, after he authored this book. And when, when he went to India, uh, he pick up, picked up a new name called Buddha, okay? And the, and, and the later Buddhist sutras or texts that got transmitted into China were actually authored by Lao Tzu. This is what the Chinese Taoists believed uh, in, in the 400 AD, okay? This is a later story. But now let's focus on our early period. So we have talked about Lao Tzu the person, okay, uh, Southern tradition. Um, so now let's move on to Lao Tzu's teachings. Well, if you read the first passage of Tao Te Ching, it says, Dao ke dao fei chang dao. Uh, the way uh, that can be talked about uh, is not the constant way, right? right? The name, that can be named is not a constant name. So what does this mean? Um, my take of this, these lines is that the Taoists, now wh whoever authored this book, uh, you know, there, there could be multiple authorship. Yeah, I, actually, in my opinion, uh, the author of today's Tao Te Ching that we read in 21st century, uh, the author is multiple. The authors are multiple. Uh, the, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. Okay, there there isn't a one single person that that wrote this uh, these chapters. Anyway, so back to the first passage. The passage, first passage, in my opinion, it shows that language is fundamentally distrustful. Okay, and to a certain degree, it, it is true. It is true, right? The name that can be named is not a constant name. Uh, I mean, from a historian's perspective. Well, think about all these names we use to understand history, right? Actually, most of the names the historians invent, invented are not constant names. Uh, we invented those names as a compromise for our own convenience, right? Think about the, this class is called early China or ancient China. I mean, this concept of ancient. Lao Tzu have no, uh, and Kong Tzu, they wouldn't have no idea they lived in an ancient time, right? Later people invented all these innovative new terms to make sense of the past. Does it make sense? I mean, think about it, not just ancient, the word ancient is problematic, but think about almost all the, all the words we invented for history are problematic to a certain degree, like a medieval, right? Medieval people, medieval people living, living, living in Europe, say in, in the ninth century, did they know that if they lived in a medieval period? They wouldn't know. They wouldn't know, right? I mean, think about all these terms like uh, not just medieval, but modern time, right? Modern, early modern, or 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 those terms like like uh, I don't know, industrial revolution, right? The the people who lived in that time that we call industrial revolution, they have no idea they lived in the age of industrial revolution. And, and, and for those terms, they're, they're, it's, it's a very problematic. I, I always tell this story. You know, years ago, I was in a conference where about industrial revolution, and there, there's, there is a presenter uh, in the conference that argued that industrial revolution is a terrible concept. It's a bad concept. Why so? Because it's, it's, it's not industrial. It's not just industrial. 
it, it's about political, cultural, social, economical. It's a whole package change of the whole society. So how come, how come you only look at industrial? Does it make sense, right? It's not just industrial. A second, it's not a revolution. There's a whole event that took place for more than like 60 years, right? It's a very gradual process of, 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 of social changes that lasted for more than a century, or more than a half century. So how, can, how can you call a social transformation that lasted for more than a century, more than a half of a century, a revolution? It doesn't make sense. So in other words, what we mean by industrial revolution is neither industrial nor revolution. But the question is, if we don't use this term to refer to the whole package of a social, economic, change, cultural changes that happened in late uh, in, in, in 19th century, do we have a better term? Do we have a better term? So historians are all quite often stuck in this dilemma that we have to find some, some problematic, controversial terms to refer to the, the, the social changes that we refer to, right? Although these terms quite often are not the good term, are not a good name, but we use those names. Does that make sense? I mean, this is just one example. If you pay attention, you will find out that in historical studies, not just in historical studies, in all research, in, in all areas of human life, we always use problem, my, prob, very problematic names for our own convenience to make sense of the world. This is a compromise. This is a necessary compromise because without this kind of compromise, we would not be able to make sense of, of the world. It would drive us crazy because you, you, you turn out that you, 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 you won't be able to talk at all, right? If you don't, if you don't accept and use those, those, those terms that are fundamentally a compromise, right? You, you, you wouldn't be able to talk. Uh, so, but the Taoists, they are reminding us that although we are using those terms we made up for our own convenience, there's a problem in there and you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware of that because language is fundamentally problematic. So at a certain degree, you cannot trust language, okay? Because the way or Tao, the Tao is simply means, uh, in, in Chinese means the way or the path is ineffable. That means once you say it, you lose it. You know the English word ineffable? Once you say it, you lose it. Uh, it's, 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 it's paradoxical, ironic, right? Uh, and not only language is, is, is like that. Uh, logic, intellect, human intellectual activities are fundamentally just like that, okay? Uh, one way to understand Lao Tzu is to use some Western philosophy, right? So in this case, I would use a 19th century German philosopher to make sense of Lao Tzu. And this uh, German philosopher's name is Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, okay? Kant has a book called uh, The Critique into Pure Reason. The Critique into Pure Reason. In this book, Kant argues that there is some fundamental structure of our mentality, uh, of our mind, uh, that allow us to think and make sense of the world. But this fundamental structure itself is actually problematic. And the human reason is insufficient to understand and question this fundamental structure by which we understand the world. So, so, so in other words, we can, we can, we can understand the world, world of the history, world of the biology, world of the geometry, many things or, or geography or whatever. There's so many subjects in the world we can understand, right? The, the natural world, society and human, human self, but the, our fun, the structure of our mind itself is a tool we rely on to make sense, to investigate into all these external objects. But this structure per se itself cannot be understood by us. So Kant is trying to understand that this kind of <laughs> fundamental limit of, of, of human reason and the, the um, and there are a couple of uh, problems with the with this uh, structure. For example, for example, uh, Kant argues that it's a human nature 
uh, I mean, relevant to this fundamental uh, mental structure uh, that we want to find out the reason for everything. But sometimes there is no reason for lots of things. But our mind, our reason just constantly driving us to find out the reason. We just tend to think there is a constant causal link of one thing lead to another. Because when we arrange the events that happen around us with the causal links, we can make sense of it. We have this almost illusion of control of events happening around us. Even though the so-called causal links we identified don't exist there, but we just think they're there. So it's a, it's a human nature to try always to try to find out the reason, right? So this, I mean, there, there, uh, the Kant uh, identified the many uh, f fundamental intrinsic, um, he, he calls them paradoxes in our mental structure, right? Uh, paradoxes are a pair of statements, one pair of statements that, are, that could both be true. For example, I could say everything has a reason. That's one statement, right? I can also make an argument saying everything has no reason. These two statements are totally diametrically opposing each other, but they can both be true, right? Philosophically, right? So, so Kant identified, uh, you know, sets many pairs of paradoxes in our fundamental structure. Okay, back to Lao Tzu. I think Lao Tzu is touching upon the same area of the uh, fundamental structure of human minds. And he's saying it's problematic. It's problematic, yeah. Um, okay, back to language. Uh, a later Taoist called the Zhuangzi further developed this uh, Lao Tzu's destruct of language. Uh, Zhuangzi argues that if you are thinking of something and you want to tell other people, how do you know that what you say is faithful and accurate to what you're thinking? How many of you are 100% sure that what you say is, is always what you, what you think? We cannot. Human nature use language in a, in a very problematic way, okay? A lot of times, so what you say is not what you think, right? So this is, in, in, in linguistic studies, this is called the gap between the signifier, which is language itself, and the signified. That means the signal conveyed to your, to your uh, conversation partner, right? There's always a gap between the signifier and the signified, okay? And this, this gap is so fundamental that it's so difficult to overcome. And, and Taoists, uh, they realize this very well, okay? So that's the first problem we have with the language, right? What you, what you say a lot of time is not what you think, okay? Uh, and provided that what you say is truly what you think, uh, draws a further reason. It says, how do you know that what you say is correctly understood by the people you talk to? This is even more difficult. Think about that, right? A lot of times people only want to see what they see and people only want to only hear what they want to hear. You say something to other people, but what they hear is what they want to hear, not what you say. What you say is a lot of times totally distorted by the people who listen to it. So that's a second, that's a second fundamental obstacle for verbal communications, all right? And then Johnson further argues, even if what you say is faithfully understood by the other person, does it mean that both of you are right? It could be just both of you happen to hold a totally wrong opinion. And, and you, you just, it's a coincidence that you find someone who happens to agree with you and you're happy. So humans are just ridiculous like that. So, so in the end, the, the Taoists, they, 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 they conclude that communication between people is not only problematic, but a lot of times meaningless, pointless. It's pointless, okay? So they, so they the Taoists are, pushing us to really think about a lot of things we take for granted in our life, like language, logic, intellectual activities, or even civilization itself, even civilization itself. Confucius, 
has this strong confidence in human civilization, right? Confucius is not someone who would promote supernatural power, the world of ghosts and spirits, right? Very different from Mozart, right? Confucius wouldn't talk about those things. Yeah, Confucius focused on the secular mundane life here and now, okay? Our, our family, government, society, and how they function. And Confucius has very strong confidence in human civilization. He believed that in order, to, just like Amantius, I mean, Amantius, Confucius, they all, they all share this basic assumption about civilization, right? As, as, as a person, you need to study ancient culture, learn from the past, right? You use all these uh, history, poetry, literature, right? To cultivate yourself, using culture to cultivate yourself to become a complete human, right? Mencius, last time we talked about Mencius, Mencius argues that to become a complete human, you need to really nurture and develop the seeds of goodness endowed by heaven, right? And that, so in other words, morality is what defines humanity. Humanity is defined by morality and morality itself is natural, okay? Uh, so this is very strong confidence in humanity very strong confidence in civilization. They believe that if, if humans do things better, right? For example, follow the ancient way, things will be better. We can solve all problems. Society, you know, ideal society is not a dream. It can be achieved, okay? But the Taoists, they think in a very different way. The Taoists are saying, wait a minute, maybe, hum maybe human civilization is not that good. It's not that good. Maybe we should not be that confident in human civilization. Okay. Well, at first you may think this is ridiculous, but not that much. Well, let, let me give you one example. In the recent anthropological studies have shown that um, agriculture was invented by humans around 10,000 years ago, right? And before the invention of agriculture, uh, Homo sapiens, I mean us, I mean, humans were already there. They were, humans were already there for, for more than 100,000 years before the invention of civilization, before the invention of agriculture. Right? Agriculture has only like a 10,000 years of history. Civilization has even shorter history, right? Five or 6,000 years. So we, so civilization is only a very, very recent event in the long history of Homo sapiens. Right, we have a, we as a Homo sapiens have evolved as hunter gatherers, okay? Because for like ninety percent of the time, the history of humans, we were hunter gatherers, okay? We, we're not used to civilization, okay? Um, you know, a lot of the research have shown that um, the invention of agriculture actually brought a lot of problems to humanity to humans, right? For example. Uh, our body has evolved to fit the life of hunter-gatherers, right? I mean, for, for children, uh, they always want to climb a tree, right? Or climb something, because their body is designed that way, right? Our body is not designed to, to farm, okay? Uh, but since 10,000 years ago, and then later since the, 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 uh, the emergence of civilization, most humans became farmers. And we had to bend our waist, bend our body, work on the field to farm. This kind of lifestyle is totally different from hunter-gatherers lifestyle that our body has evolved to. So this creates a lot of problems like back pain, neck pain, ankle problems, all kinds of problems. Because our body is, is actually uh, designed, evolved to to run, to chase animals, right? To travel around, not to have a, a, a sedentary village life, living by your field and work in the field, you know, all day. Not the kind of a farming life, okay? And look at our diet. I mean, everybody knows that the most healthy diet of human beings is is hunter gatherers kind of diet. So that means a whole variety of food. Right, proteins, right, meat, veggies, berries, right, the fiber, right, yeah, the vitamin, 
we need various kinds of sources because hunter-gatherers lifestyle will provide us with that kind of a very healthy diet. But, but think about the, the lifestyle of a farmer, right? Since the, since the invention of agriculture, we are forced to focus on one or two grains as our major source of, of food, right? In West Asia, it's gonna be wheat, right? Or barley, right? And in, in, in East Asia, it's Southern China is rice, Northern China is millet, right? So more than 50 or even 80% of our, our diet is one single grain and it give us a lot of problem. The di diabetes, many other problems, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is that human, humans as a species has, have not evolved to fit the life of agriculture or civilization to a certain degree. Yeah, our body actually probably it has been has evolved to fit the life of hunter gatherers. Okay. Um, anyway, okay, back to back to Taoism. So the Taoists they are questioning the Confucian confidence in civilization, and the, and, and the Taoists are saying maybe civilization wouldn't serve the purpose as as it should as it should. Okay. So we should be suspicious of of civilization. So civilization may not be the the best way to fit humans as a, as, as, as a species, uh, homo sapiens, right? I mean, think about it. You know, if you really run a hunter-gatherer's life, then your diet would be healthier. Uh, I mean, provided that you can get enough food. And then you don't, and, and physically, your physicality will be, will be much better. And even your mental health will probably be better because you're in nature all the time. You're running in nature all the time in sunlight, right? That's far better life for your mental health, better than most modern people sitting in an office, right? You know, who don't see sunlight every day you know, and spend too much time looking at the screen, right? So in other words, this kind of life, it really doesn't fit our human nature of hunter gatherers. That's what you know, a lot of scientists are trying to tell us. Um, so that's that's the uh, the question uh, of Taoists, uh, and the Taoists also question this human centered uh, culture, right? And for Confucius, Confucius is sort of like a Renaissance period humanist. He believed that the well being, happiness of the human nature, or the order of a human society, are the most important thing. Okay, humans are always at the center of of Confucian philosophy. But the Taoists, they're questioning. They, they question that, you know, look at what humans have been doing, right? Uh, we, in order for our survival, we're, do very, we're doing very crude things to other species. We're destroying them, right? I mean, this, this point of view has been totally uh, verified by anthropological studies, right? I mean, think about 10,000 years ago, between like 40,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, a lot of made large animal species in Eurasia and in Americas went into extinction. And their extinction happened exactly at the same time when humans arrived in those continents. Many scientists believe this is not a coincidence. Although it's controversial, but many, of, many scientists argue that it's humans that actually is responsible for the distinct, distinction of all these species. And we're still doing this. We're still destroying uh, species and we're still destroying uh, uh, Mother Earth. Uh, the, I mean, think about all these terrible things that humans have done to nature, right? And, and to other species, right? So Taoists, they're not happy with this. They think human, a human-centered philosophy uh, could be the problem, could be the, 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 the cause of the many problems we have today. And eventually, ironically, human may destroy themselves. They destroy some themselves with their intellects. So in other words, the more intellectual activities you have, the more technological advancement you have, the closer you, you may be to destruction. That, that's what Taoists are saying, yeah. Uh, you know, this is why I always think a lot of Hollywood movies are Taoist movies, right? Think about so the movie of, a, I don't know, Terminator, Terminator. Everybody have watched the series, the movie series of Terminators, right? Have you watched that movie? You must have, right? Yeah. 
I mean, in my opinion, it's a typical Taoist movie. Yeah. Human rely on technology so much that once the technology goes wrong, we became the victim of the technology. Right? Think about that. You know, this is this is a fundamental paradox in 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 in, in our life. And it happens all the time, right? The, 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 the more you rely on one tool, uh, the more you become the slave of that tool. Let's think about a computer or a cell phone, right? Now cell phones do lots of things for us. We think that's most useful tool for us, but what if you lose it? What, what if you lose it? Then, 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 <laughs> then, you, then you cannot function, right? So this is the irony of, of our reliance on technology. And the Taoists are saying, this is, this is problematic. This is problematic, okay? So our trust, our trust in language, civilization, logic, intellects, uh, even and even technology, all these confidence uh, are problematic in the eyes of the Taoist. Well, okay, back, back to the movie of Terminator, right? Eventually the machines we create to work for us will come back to overwhelm us, okay? So we will become not only slaves to machines, uh, we, we, we may even destroy it. Uh, by them, okay? And I think about other movies like in The Matrix, right? They tell the same story. They tell the same story. We rely on technology so much, right? Artificial intelligence one day may come back to destroy us, control us, and enslave us, right? That's exactly the movie Matrix is about, right? It's a Taoist movie. It's a Taoist, typical Taoist type of warning to human confidence in our civilization, in our technology, okay? So what kind of a lifestyle the Taoists are, uh, promote? Okay, so in contrary to all these confidence, blind confidence, Taoists are saying, as humans, you probably cannot be that arrogant, okay? You have to realize your weaknesses and, and your problems. So be humble. Humility or humbleness is, is, is crucial, okay? You have to realize that we are making mistakes all the time. And our confidence in civilization, in culture, in our culture, and in our technologies uh, uh, and its ability to improve our life has no ground. Technology could destroy us. Civilization could, could, could destroy itself, okay? So you want to be very, very humble, just like water that flow, always flows to the lower place, okay? You don't want to self aggrandize you don't want to be self-aggrandizing, arrogance, and, and self-promoting. You want to be like a water that always flows to the lower place. Yeah, keep a low key, low, keep a low, low profile, okay? So that's the first thing. Second, you want to be flexible. You want to be supple. So, so contrary, in contrary to common sense, right? Most people believe that being strong is good. Uh, being strong, being useful is good. Being hard is good, right? Yeah, you wanna, you want, you want, you wanna be a, a, a strong man, right? But Taoists say, you probably wanna look at the opposite, because without soft, there is no such thing like hard. Without weak, without things that are weak, there are no no things that are hard. So all these concepts exist in in relation to each other as binaries, right? So all these black and white, good and good and bad, you know, strong and weak, hard and soft, right? All, all these concepts, they, they exist uh, as, as binaries to each other. So, so maybe sometimes you need to look at it the other side that is different from the common sense, right? Sometimes soft can over the strong. Think about water. Water is very soft compared to rock. But after thousands of years of uh, impact from water, even the hardest rock will be destroyed. Water will find its way, although it's very humble, always flows to the lowest place, but it creates the deepest valley in the whole world, right? So in this case, the soft can overcome uh, the hard. And the weak can also overcome the hard, uh, the strong a lot of times. Right, so Lao is giving all these all these examples to uh, to inspire us to look at the other side uh, of the story. Okay, and um, and the simple is better than the complicated. Okay, the the simpler uh, your plan is, uh, the the more likely it will it will uh, it will work out. It will work out. 
So simplicity is very good. So make your life simple. Make your life simple. Okay. Uh, why, why Tao Te Ching uses so a lot of so many metaphors of water? You know, some scholars believe that is probably because they're they're from the south, right? In southern China, if you look at the terrain of southern China, very different from the north and central plain. Uh, very different from the plain in the north. In the south, you have not only a lot of forests, but also a lot of rivers, a lot of rivers, a lot of ponds. A lot of a uh, lot of uh, lakes, yeah. So it's not surprising that Southerners use water uh, as a metaphor to describe uh, the philosophy uh, they believe in. Okay, but Lao Tzu also says Tao or Wei can be used as a strategy. Yeah, if you understand the the value of the soft, uh, the flexible, uh, the weak, and the useless. Uh, you would uh, you would uh, you would broaden your horizon, right? The use of uselessness. So, so the Taoists believe that um, sometimes it's useful to be useless. It's, again, it's paradoxical. It's as as, 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 uh, as irony, right? You know, Taoists are very interesting ironies. Uh, one example later given by uh, later Taoist drones is that say think about in in today's say. Russia, right? We know that Putin is escalating his war against Ukraine. So he's drafting, drafting from his population, from his citizens. So a lot of people don't want to be drafted by, by Putin into his army and, and got sent to uh, Ukraine and die. We know that the casualties uh, on the Russian side in, in, in the Ukraine war is, is huge, right? So in that case, would you want, if you know that, if you got drafted into the army and the center of the front and the fight, and very likely you're going to die there, it's, let's say 50% chance you're going to die there. In that case, maybe you want to be physically disabled. In that case, a useless, physically disabled person will survive because they will escape the drafting. Does it make sense? So, so in other words, something useful is not always useful. Sometimes being useless is more useful than being useful. So that's, 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 that's sort of a paradoxical, ironic way of thinking. Yeah. But if you look at a human society, ironies like that are everywhere. You, they're ubiquitous, okay, ubiquitous, okay? So Taoists are there thinking in a very different way, all right? Uh, so yeah, so useless is sometimes it's good. Just like, you know, being weak, soft, and flexible, all these are good things, okay? And being empty is good. Uh, being empty is better than being filled, being full, because being empty means that you still have all these potential uh, to 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 accommodate more things, right? Yeah. So so nothing is absolute. So Taoists are pushing for a relativist relativistic way of thinking, for you to broaden your horizon and look at the other side of the story. Okay. Yeah, they're interested in the dark side of the moon, basically. Yeah. Uh, and then the Tao is to say this kind of a realization or mode of thinking is important for rulership, for governance. Okay, rulers should understand this, okay, uh, to avoid a lot of mistakes, to avoid arrogance, and to rule better. Uh, Lao Tzu particularly says a small government is better than a large government. A lot of rulers believe that. If you have a very strong government, very strong, very hard, has a lot of resources, a lot of military, right? A large government that controls everything is good, right? As a ruler, that means power. More power is good, right? But Lao Tzu is saying, Lao Tzu is saying power is dangerous. And a small government is better than a large government. And I believe that Adam Smith would have probably agree with that, right? Would have probably agree with Lao Tzu. Yeah, because, uh, you know, classical economists that believe that small government is the way to go, right? You want to let the society to organize itself with the invisible hand rather than government taking care of everything. And that's exactly what Lao Tzu is saying, right? A small government is good, okay? Simple life is good. And the, the simpler, the better, okay? And sometimes even isolation is good. Well, this is not something Adam Smith would say, right? Adam Smith would say, you know, um, connections and trades between societies are good, but Lao Tzu is saying isolation is probably not that bad, 
okay? And sometimes even ignorance is good, yeah. And it could lead to the harmony, yeah. And desires are terrible. Well, this is similar to many other ancient religions, right? Desires are considered as a terrible thing, dangerous threat uh, to, to happiness. Yeah. So if you, you cannot find permanent constant happiness in, 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 this, in satisfaction of your desires. If you just pursue and try to satisfy your desires, it's endless process. It's an endless journey and it will end, it will, it will lead to nowhere. It will lead to nowhere. So eventually you're gonna have to curb your desires. You have to limit your desires to a certain degree. Okay. So how do we how do we uh, how do we evaluate uh, Lao Tzu type of Taoism? Uh, my understanding is that if you compare Taoism with Confucianism, one Taoism clearly values nature. Okay. For Lao Tzu, nature is the greatest model humans should humbly emulate, okay? But Confucius wouldn't say that. Confucius has this very strong in human civilization based on culture, okay? What is culture? Well, all these, all, these, uh, all these cultural products we produced in the past, sage kings, right? Classical studies, history, poetry, right? All these, all these uh, ritual, ceremony, morality, right? All these, all these things are made by human, and we proudly make those things to improve our lives. So Confucius is a typical humanist who have a very strong confidence in, 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 in the human's ability to improve itself uh, with its own culture. But Taoists, they question that. They question language, logic, civilization, culture, technology, everything. They believe that maybe we should follow nature. In this sense, we gotta have to get away from human-centered technology, from human-centered worldview, from human-centered uh, philosophy, okay? Instead, we look at nature and try to live a life as natural as possible. That means, probably means get back to our sort of hunter-gatherers instinct in the lifestyle, you know, keep, our, keep away from civilization, you know? Because you know, hunter gatherers had no civilization, right? Yeah, um, but maybe maybe there, that that kind of life is is the most natural for Homo sapiens. So that's that's the Taoist naturalism that I identified from from Tao Te Ching. But I could be wrong. I mean, I I, I totally want to take a Taoist approach to 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 um, to Taoism itself. So that means uh, I cannot be too confident in my own interpretation of Taoism. Uh, I, 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 I'm totally ready to admit my own mistakes uh, and, and I'd love to hear criticism uh, of my own reading. Uh, but before we finish the lecture, let me, let me show you something. This is an interesting, uh, this is a, 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 I took a picture of this page from a magazine for the Colorado Springs shooting magazine. Okay, this is from the shooting magazine, it's a sports, okay? And then in this article, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching was quoted, okay? So I need a volunteer to read this quote. And this quote in the eyes of the author is probably useful to whoever, to whoever uh, that want to be excellent in, in the game of shooting in the sports. So I need a volunteer to read this to, to the class. So who can help us? Julia, go ahead. Okay, it says, the soft overcomes the hard, the slow overcomes the fast. Let your workings remain a mystery. Just show people the results. Thank you. Do you think that could work in sports? Well, sometimes it could work. It could. Yeah. All right, so any questions? If there are no questions, then let's have a 10 minutes break and then we will have a discussion of allowance. All right? So everybody uh, pick up one passage to discuss, at least one, all right, in the discussion section. I will see you in 10 minutes. We're gonna come back at a 6.05, all right? I will see you at a 6.05.